around the world, the Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here. We'd like to welcome everyone today to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Tuesday, Tuesday, November the 16th, 2021. We just welcome you today. We want to say thank you for allowing us to come into your home, your place of business, wherever that you might be, and allow us to come and share with you from the unsearchable riches of Christ. No man can exhaust the riches of Christ and his word. It is impossible to exhaust the enormity of the revelation that God's word provides for mankind. Your revelation will grow exponentially if you'll pray and spend time in his word. The illumination of God's word through the Holy Spirit of God can open up your mind and give you understanding that is far superior to that concerning the natural man. We're told in Ephesians 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of him. What will he grant us? Give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the saints. He will grant you and I revelation and wisdom and the knowledge of him. You see, you can talk a lot about religion and ideology and interpretation, but it takes the Holy Spirit of God to illuminate Paul is saying to illuminate your understanding. It's it's like anything that we are studying. There's nothing more edifying than we, we say to get a revelation. But understanding the revelation is what's the real key. How does it work? How does it come together? What makes it work? What makes it that way? That's why I said yesterday when I would ask men, why do you believe that? You see, people will tell you, oh, I believe this, and I'm I'm firm on my conviction, and I'm adamant, et cetera, et cetera. But why do you believe that? They don't even know why they believe that. I've I've had people to try to convert me uh, to oneness, the oneness doctrine. and But they would say, well, now I can't explain it, But you need to call this person. They'll explain it to you. So you really don't know why you believe that. You only believe that because you say this or whatever the Seventh-day Adventist might teach. Well, we believe this because what the Bible says here. Why do you believe that? Well, that's what I was told. No, you need to understand why you believe what you believe. I, I remember, uh, and I've said this, and I, and, I, and I pray I say this with humility, but for two years I walked under such an anointing after the 40-day fast. Everything I read was a revelation. My, my, all of a sudden my understanding was accelerated to connecting the dots, making things fit, making things work. And you're like, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. You read the seven heads in Revelation 12, they have seven crowns. Then when you get to Revelation 13, one of those heads has ten crowns. That's the final seventh 
satanic kingdom. The first was Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Thus, when John the Revelator was writing the book of Revelation, in Revelation 17, he said, five are fallen and one is, meaning the Roman kingdom. One is yet to come. So when that seventh satanic kingdom, seventh satanic head comes, it'll be out of that head and those ten horns that'll arise the little horn. That's the Antichrist. He is the eighth, John said, but he is of the seven. Now, I personally believe because they're all satanic kingdoms, there will be some type of spiritual genetic DNA attachment to all kingdoms and that attachment, of course, would be they're satanic. They're satanic. So Revelation 17, 11, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So he has an attachment because of the satanic DNA. He's of the seven, but he's of the eighth. So he's that eighth, and the word eight, the number eight, in biblical numerology means new beginnings. So it'll be a new satanic beginning, but it will also be the end of that new beginning as well. And then Christ will come, set up his kingdom in the earth. And the earth will remain as we presently know it for one more thousand years. And at the close of the thousand years, Satan will be released from the bottomless pit He'll go across the breadth of the earth, the Bible says. He will coerce people to rebel against God. He'll lead that rebellion. Fire will come down from heaven, from God the Father, will consume them. Then we go into the great white throne judgment, and heaven and earth will have fled away. That's when the fiery holocaust, 2 Peter chapter 3, that's when that will take place. I, I, I snigger sometimes. Uh, when men talk about that happening as a thief in the night, they, they claim that's the second advent. And I'm thinking, again, they're just being taught. They were taught wrong, and they continue to be purveyors of the wrong doctrine. And uh, if you study that out, you'll find out it is pre-Adamic, the, the earth that then was in the water, Satan's rebellion, the deluge, out of the water, Revelation, excuse me, Genesis 1 and 2, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. He was taking the earth then out of the water that then was. And, of course, he's saving the earth for a fiery holocaust and judgment at that point in time, which will be a 1,000 years later. At the close of the 1,000 years, we will go into eternity. No more sickness, no more disease, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. It'll be as it was in the beginning. Hard to imagine a world of that magnitude, but that's the type of world God is going to bring together and in, in fruition. And I believe in that time, you and I, of course, will be glorified saints of God. And there'll be human beings procreating and living in the earth uh, just like we are now, but it'll be a sinless sinless. There'll be no temptation, nothing of that nature. Uh, I believe those people will live forever. Why? Because death will have been destroyed. So they will live forever, but not as glorified bodies like me and you, just natural people. That's hard to fathom, hard to conceive all of these things. They're not easy to be understood. <clears throat> and that's why I say with, 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 with humility, as well as I understand it, that's how I see after the new heaven and the new earth going into eternity. We want to look at Romans 7, verse 23 today. We addressed verse 22 yesterday, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It's the inward man that always seeks and desires to do that which is right. It is the outer man, the carnal, the clay jar, the vessel, the earthen vessel that wants to do that which is evil. Verse 23, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Again, the apostle Paul 
is not addressing the Mosaic law, but rather the law or principle of sin and death. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Meaning these are principles. For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, once you become in Christ, once you become born again, once you become justified, because you are justified, you are made free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin, meaning sin, having dominion, authority, or lordship over your life. Sin now lo- longer has dominion over you, neither does death. Death loses its grip on everyone who becomes born again, justified by the blood of Christ. When a believer dies, they go to be with God. The body just goes back into the earth, in the grave, lying there in the casket or whatever, and the body is asleep, totally asleep. Now, the sinner, when they die, their body also is asleep, but their soul and their spirit went to hell because they are not free from the law of sin and death, because they are not free from the law of sin and of death. They are subjected to it. They are subject to it and what it brings in eternity. Um, Hebrews 2.14, but we see Jesus. No, that through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Jesus had to die and be raised from the dead to take power over death and its authority and lordship. If you're not born again, death still has lordship over your life. Now, that's spiritual death without God. Both bodies of the Christian and the sinner go to sleep. But the believer's soul and spirit goes to be with God. The unbeliever, the sinner, the wicked, the lawless, their soul and spirit goes to hell. 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus had to be manifest and take down that authority and lordship of death and of sin. Now the believer can live a life without living a life of sin. I don't teach, I don't preach sinless perfection. As long as you're in this clay jar, the the propensity, the proclivity, the tendency to sin, to err, to make bad decisions will exist. But we're told in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 5 and 4, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You see, everything that I've been preaching about in Romans 5, 6, and 7, it's all based on faith. You're justified by faith. You believe what Jesus did covered your sins. That's what you believe. That's what you embrace. That's what you live. You live it every day. Now, Let me go back to Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. See, I'm free from the law of sin and of death. You can live a life free of sin. You can live a life free of the dominion of death, the lordship of death. Remember, death will also exist in the millennial reign of Christ. At the end of the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, We go into what is known as the great white throne judgment. That's Revelation chapter 20. And at the conclusion of the great white throne judgment, then death, which is an entity, and hell, which is an entity, all of them will be cast into where? The lake of fire. And that's where the devil, the false prophet, and the beast or the Antichrist already are. Now, the Antichrist and the 
false prophet have already been there for a thousand years, which verifies, authenticates there's no liberation, neither annihilation. You don't get burned up. Some guy sent me a book years ago trying to tell me how wrong I was, that, that, that people will go to hell, but after a while they'll be let out of hell. There's no Bible that ever proved that. The rich man in hell is still there today. Jesus gave that, 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 that story 2,000 years ago. The man is there. At the end of the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ, he will be resurrected. That's the second resurrection. He'll be resurrected. He'll stand before God at the great white throne judgment. God will open up the book of life. His name will not be there. And the other books are record books, and God will open them and show him how wicked a man he really was. Again, as I said yesterday, nobody is ever saved. We have no record of anybody being saved at the great white throne judgment. Yet there are those who teach that. Why do we read in Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. See, if you're in the first resurrection, that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ the, 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 of the righteous, He's the first fruits of the first resurrection. So death cannot have any dominion or lordship over you. If you're in the second resurrection, that resurrection is merely about being judged. But because you have not eternal life, you're going to die the second death. That's John 5, 28, 29. Marvel not at this for the hours coming and the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So they're going to be resurrected to be damned. We're going to be resurrected to have eternal life. Vast, vast difference, night and day. So as I alluded to yesterday numerous times, why? Why do people believe some of the things they believe? What is it that they say, well, I believe this, but then you say, tell me why. Explain it to, to me, why you believe that. And they're without words. They're without speech. It's because somebody told them, and that's what we call being brainwashed. You're brainwashed. Somebody hammered that into your head and told you that was the absolute truth. I had it done to me. I remember I was probably, I don't know, 26, 27 years of age, somewhere in that neighborhood, Twenty in my mid to late 20s. And I would, I would ask preachers, help me to explain 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Explain that to me, which says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. I said, explain that to me and why the church will not be here. Because Paul says that's, that's how it's going to be. The church will be here and see this. No, 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 that's not the way it is. Well, then explain it to me. Well, you're too young, you're too naive, you don't understand, you leave it alone. The truth was, they didn't understand either. They were only telling or saying what they had been told or taught. Then I come along and begin to expound on it. And, 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 and I don't say this to be pompous by no means, but I, I would trip them up so terribly. I mean, I, I just, it wasn't me. They couldn't answer the scriptures. I remember a brother said, you know, get, get your, because I had a Dakes Bible, uh, uh, Thinnis, J. Dake, I'll give him his credit. He was a smart man, but he plagiarized E.W. Bullinger to no end. People didn't know that back then. I didn't know that till just a few years ago. But my point is, I was man said, how about getting your Bible and uh, turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 2 in the Dake Bible. And he's quoting from 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, where Paul said, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, then shall that wicked be revealed. And then and he says, now turn, I think it's page 279 in the Dakes Annotated Bible. Annotated meaning notes. 
One guy said, I thought it was anointed. I said, no, it's annotated. And anytime there's an, uh, uh, something is annotated, it means notes are added. So he says, look here at what Dake says. And he says, he's trying to explain 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. He said, one of three things will be taken out of the world. And so he said, let's look at Dake's notes. Well, it won't be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be in the earth to save tribulation saints. Of course, this is a, this is a pre-tribulation perspective. Has to be here to save pre, uh, uh, tribulation saints. The two witnesses have to be here. They've got to be anointed so the Holy Spirit cannot be taken out of the way. Then he says, thirdly, it has to be the church taken out of the world and that's what, that's what the restrainer is. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. He said, so it's the church taken out of the world. I said, with all respect, that's not what the Bible says. What are you talking about? I said, look at what it says. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. I said, nothing is raptured. Church is not raptured. Something is taken out of the way. Uh, just the other day, my son pulled in behind my wife's car. For her to get out, he's got to take his car and get it out of the way. He doesn't rapture the car out. He backs it up, puts it in another lane so she can get out. Nothing was taken out of the world, but something was taken out of the way. And that he that's taken out of the way is Michael the archangel. He's taken out of the way. And let's the Antichrist the abomination of desolation, all these things come to fruition. Well, where does he go? He starts a war with Satan, Revelation 2, 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. That's, that's the he. Well, how do we know that for certain? Gabriel tells Daniel in Daniel 10, 21, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. So Gabriel tells us, I think it's almost 600 years before Paul writes this, it is Michael the archangel that's holding or withholding back the revelation of the Antichrist. Now, I, I dare say any of you, I know I haven't ever heard anybody pontificate or explain Daniel 10, 21, never. And especially associated with 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. And that's, that's one of the things the Lord put in my heart 25 years ago. He said, the reason prophecy teachers cannot go further in my word is because they all say, we're not going to be here. So they don't, go in, they don't continue to study the deeper things of the word, and therefore they're unable to connect all the dots together. See? I mean, I've heard John Hagee say it. God bless him. The Antichrist is going to be shot in the head and going to be raised from the dead. Brother John Hagee, would you give me Bible for that? Well, there is none. That's just, <laughs> that's just baloney. It's just made up. One of the, one of the uh, heads is wounded. But the deadly wound is healed. It says it's healed, not resurrected. You see, that's clear. That's clear. Yet they will say something bogus, entirely bogus, and then argue with you till they're blue in the face. I'm wrong. They're right. And what they're saying, the Bible doesn't even say. It's not even close to saying it. Even like the brother that said, something's taken out of the world. I said, that's not what the Bible says. Something's taken out of the way. This, this, is, this is why there's so much error in the church because men are not honest with the word of God. It's as Paul said to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 4, I believe it's verse 1 or 2, he said, we don't handle the word of God deceitfully nor with craftiness. We, we, don't, we don't take God's word and handle it deceitfully. Why? We're honest ministers. Now, I'm not sitting here attacking anyone's honesty and integrity, but I'm telling you, they're saying things that the Bible does not say. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. 
Paul said we're not handling the word of God deceitfully, meaning you can take God's word, you can handle it, manipulate it, twist it to make it say something that it does not say. That was Paul's other statement to me was profound in 2 Corinthians 2, 17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. You see, they had the word of God. They corrupted it. They handled it deceitfully. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say everybody intentionally and willfully handles the word of God deceitfully, but they handle it as they were taught it, and they were taught it wrong. That was your great, great council meeting in Acts chapter 15 where they're, they're, they're trying to get understanding. Thus they use the phrase, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Ghost. Well, what, what's the deal here? They're trying to get a witness from the Spirit of God. Are we headed in the right direction? Are we headed in the right direction? Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than necessary. these necessary things. There was a witness from the Holy Spirit. They knew they were in harmony now with God, the Holy Spirit, and with the doctrine of the Pauline epistles and justification by faith, and you don't have to be circumcised. Listen, they like to destroy the church over circumcision. You, you know, I, I can't get mature ministers to look and say, wait a minute, this was a point of contention. Well, the pre-tribulation rapture is a point of contention, terrible point of contention. I just can't believe God let us go through that. Look at all the martyrdom in the New Testament church. Look at it. Read the closing verses in Hebrews chapter 11. Sawn asunder, den of lions, fiery furnace. Some were delivered, some were not delivered. This is why I say we have Americanized Christianity. <laughs> look, look, if we could see the gravity of, of the persecution in North Korea, we'd all bite our lip off, every one of us. These people over there that have found, discovered Jesus Christ, that's their only hope. They have no hope of ever being free. You know, I appreciated Donald Trump's mindset to try to develop Kim Jong-un, because he talked about their beautiful coastline, and you can have all of these beautiful homes and apartments and townhouses and, and make it a, a, a recreational uh, coastline, bring in industry and, and bring in prosperity, et cetera, et cetera. These people over there, they have no hope. So when they hear about the message of Jesus Christ, that's the only hope they have. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If those North Koreans believed that all they had was in this life, their hope was in Jesus, just in this present life, they'd be miserable too. But they have hope beyond this life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay. Let's get back to verse 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Let me say this pointedly. This war in these clay jars, these earthen vessels, will not cease until you die or Christ returns. As long as you're in this clay jar, there is something that Satan can appeal to relative to sin and suffering. Some of you listening to me right now, you bear in your body a constant pain, a constant anomaly, uh, a, a, an element of constant suffering. And it, it can come through many, 
many venues, many different veins and walks of life. It may be marital distress. It may be suffering uh, between your, you and your parents, uh, conniving, dishonesty, cheating, uh, people tampering with wills and documents and, and, and people cheating to try to get the estate. Just, 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 it's just a constant war. Paul talked about That's what he's talking about. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. You see, Satan wants to bring you into captivity, chain you, harness you to the principle of the law of sin that you have eternal damnation from God. Where is that found? He said, in my members. I remember when my father died and, and, and I was on the radio live and my wife found him, and she opens the door, and that's an absolute no-no. Don't ever open the door while I'm on the radio live because it's such a distraction. She opened the door. I look up, and I'm like, get out, get out, you know, with, with my eyes. I'm not saying it. And she said, I think your daddy's dead. And when she said that, I said, what? She said, I think your daddy is dead. And so I was on the air live, and I said, I've got to go. And that's when I was dealing with uh, Paul Wright, Genesis Communications out of Minnesota. If I remember correctly back then, that was in the year 2000. And I said, Paul, 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 come on the air. I've got to, I've got to shut it down. And I said, I've got to leave. I, I apologize, but I, I can't continue the programming. And a dear brother in California who was listening uh, said, I, I know Pastor Lankford uh, of him. Uh, what he teaches, what he preaches. He said, by the way, he's lost his mother and his grandmother in just uh, about five weeks ago. Uh, and he said, I'll, 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 I'll take over probably 30 to 40 minutes left of the program. He said, I'll take over. And people just call in. That's when we could take phone calls back in the day and um, said, let's pray for him. And uh, so I, I, I went to where my dad was, and he was dead. And he was in a kneeling position beside his bed. And I, I remember standing there, and I remember the Lord specifically said, he's now free. He's free. And, and that revelation, I understood now. The toil, the pain, the agony is in this old diseased, decayed, ruined, and rotting corpse body. You know, he had had a stroke. He fell, hit his head on a chest of drawers, and he bled to death. But the Lord said, he's free. You see, the, the suffering for the Christian is in this body, this clay jar. Uh, the weaknesses, the fragility, dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, whatever the case might be in the body, it's in the body. It's not in the spirit. It's in the body. I won't get off my subject, but... Sinners who are lost and die and go to hell without Christ, they have all their faculties in their spirit body. Now, don't ask me to explain that. I, 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 I'm not sure that I understand it, but I do know, according to the rich man in hell in Luke 16, he had all of his faculties. The only faculty we don't witness there is his smelling. But he could see, hear, taste, and touch. They were all there. They existed. And you might say, Taste and smelling go together, the five senses. We see four of them. And, and because it is a spiritual body, it cannot be liberated nor annihilated. It can't be burned up like a leaf, and there's nothing left after the profuse burning. But it, it, it exists forever. Uh, and like I said yesterday, the man that sent me the book, you know, they're only, they're only in hell for a while, and then they, they're punished and they get out. There's no Bible for that. That, that, that. That's just that's just heresy. And if that were true, shoot, as the Corinthians said, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, and after a while in hell we're going to get out. So why bother to serve God? Commit all the fornication you want. Commit all the adultery you want. Get, get high as many times as you want. Do, do all of these things. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Yeah, you'll go to hell for, I don't know, week, 10 days, a month, then you get out. It don't work like that. 
That's another lie Satan is a purveyor of and wants people to believe. And people see right books, and what they're writing is heresy. Jesus said it, Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine: 29, Ye do err, not knowing of the Scriptures nor the power of God. Uh, there's, a, there's a purported doctrine from the Catholic Church. I read it years ago. I don't remember the exact details. But purportedly, some pope had a revelation from the Apostle Peter, because, you know, he's the, 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 he was the first pope. And uh, Peter tells this pope, yeah, people do go to hell. They burn for a while. But God is so full of love, grace, and mercy. After a, an element of punishment, torment, tormenting, and vexation, they finally get out. This is supposedly a revelation given to one of the popes. Don't, don't believe that. You can probably Google that and find it uh, under the auspices of Revelation. Peter tells the pope, God is such a God of love and grace and mercy after a particular period of time. He lets people out of hell. You might say that maybe is purgatory in their minds. I don't know, but I do know this. You either make it in or you're lost. There's no in-between. There's no middle place. Paul says the law of sin, the law of sin and of death, is working against the law of my mind. The mind here refers to one's willpower. This is a carnal law attempting to overcome sin without God's grace through the finished work of Christ on the cross. You cannot, by mere willpower, defeat the devil. Jesus had to defeat him for you. Now you put your faith in what Jesus did and not your willpower. Oh, I can defeat the devil. I can overcome. I can do this. I can do that. You, my friend, have I-itis. You, you put your faith in you. I, I, I. I did this. I did that. I can do this. I can do it. Paul said, I can do all things through who? All things through Christ Jesus. Not in myself. John 15, 5, I'm the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Did you hear that? Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So the mind here that Paul addresses refers to one's willpower. Now, there are those who have great willpower. They can say no, they can fast, they, they can just do without. They have great willpower. But see, that willpower, in essence, is, 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 a, is a law relative to the flesh. I, I can overcome this. And some things you can, but you can't overcome sin. You can't overcome death through your flesh. Do you hear me? You cannot overcome death through your flesh and your own willpower. I will not die. I will not die. I believe I'm not going to. Listen, your day comes, you're going to die. Or the Lord's going to return one. That time is predetermined. That time is set. You cannot change it. Solomon said you can hasten it. You can do foolish, cynical things, and you can hasten death in your life by going down the road in a car doing 150 miles an hour and you blow a tire and you have a terrible wreck and you get killed. See? Ecclesiastes 8, verse 8. There is no man, no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. When it's time for the spirit to leave the clay jar, it's leaving. No man there is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death. You, 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 you can't in your own willpower say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to die now. Now, there are those who have the will to live in a, in a circumstance, and it's, it's really not their time. It's just not their time. 
and their determination, their, their, their constitution, strong. I'm, I'm not going to go now. And then there are those who, they're ready. They, they want to go on. They want to get out of the old diseased body and to go to be with the Lord. So this law, this law that Paul is talking about, it's, it's one's self-will. And that self-will, sadly, can destroy you. You, you. you can be so strong, so self-willed, it can be a detriment to who you are. You know, we all can take a disposition where we're not going to yield. We're not going to give in to that. <laughs> I've often said, as we get older, the old country boy said, man, that guy's set in his ways. You're not going to change him. He's just, he's just, that's who he is. And I've often thought as I grew older, Lord, I don't want to become obstinate. I don't want to become unteachable where I can't continue to grow and learn things. You know, you can show some people where they're absolutely emphatically wrong. You know what they're going to say? No, I'm not. You can prove it. You can demonstrate it. You can authenticate it. You can verify it. You can document it. You can bring witnesses, but they'll still say, nope, nope, it's not right. I'm right. All that's wrong. See, that's, that's, that's really stubbornness more than self-will. But the sub stubbornness, that spirit of stubbornness and rebellion can take over the will of a man. Thus, his will becomes a will of rebellion, rejecting, spurning that which is truthful and honest. Now, Satan, now listen to me. Satan seeks to distort our minds and our way of thinking, whether or not we mind the things of the flesh or the things of the spirit. What does your mind attend to? What does your mind focus on? What gets your attention relative to your mind? You know, there are many times... Uh, when I'm studying, man, I just shut everything out. I shut everything down because I'm trying to comprehend something. And I feel like I can comprehend it. As the old boy said, if I could just get my thoughts together, you know, get, get my bearings. You know, am I going north or am I going east? Am I going west or am I going north? You want to get the right perspective. Satan is always seeking to distort our mind. See, he wants the thinking to be wrong. Have you ever thought something, and then you come to find out you were wrong? Your, your thought process was wrong? Or even better yet, you thought you understood, but then all of a sudden, you really get it. The, the, the light really goes off. Now you have the comprehension. You're like, wow, man, I got it. And I got it now. Now I know why it works like it works. Why? Because you have comprehended it. You have fully come to understand it. You see, the carnal mind, if you live a carnally minded life, you're always subject to the spirit of, or I should say the law of sin and of death. If your mind is always carnal, you'll be brought under subjection to the law of sin and of death. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Their mind is on fleshly things. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity or it's hostile against God. The carnal mind is not subject 
subjected to the law of God. The carnal mind, the carnal mind is not subjected to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Have you ever caught yourself thinking and you admit to yourself, my thinking is carnal? I want to bust him in the face. I want to bust him in the head. I want to tell her off. I want to make his head look like a sack full of doorknobs. See, that's, that's thinking. That's the mind. That's the flesh. They that are after the flesh, or they that walk in the flesh, they think about the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, or to be carnally thinking is death. To be carnally thinking is death. But to be spiritually minded, or to be spiritually thinking is life. How is it in Isaiah 26, 3, we're told, whose mind is stayed on thee, he will keep him in perfect peace. Your mind is on God. God is the prince of peace. So if your mind is on him, that princehood, that prince, that majestic of the prince, the majesty of the prince works now in me and my mind is stayed on him or I'm thinking about him more and more. Now I have peace. Now, if my mind is negative, 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 ne negative, thinking about all the sordid doom and gloom, and, 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 and it's bad out there. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. It's bad. But I'm going to tell you why a lot of people are sick, they're diseased, they're weak, they're infirmed. That's all they listen to. That's all they read. Negative, negative, negative. So they mind, they think all the time on carnality. They think about dying. They think about death. I think about death periodically. I'm 60, will be 67 years old in February, but I certainly do not dwell on it. I've got too much to do to dwell and mind that all the time. You know, what are you attending? What are you minding? What, where, where is your focus? What is your mind on? And if your mind is constantly on negativity, you will also be sick and diseased and infirmed in your body. You know, I, I, uh, back a couple months ago, I was clearing my throat a lot in a program, and someone noticed it and said something to me. Well, it's allergies. Rag, ragweed uh, in August and September, actually till we get the first frost, bothers me. And there was nothing wrong with me. It's just drainage from the allergy, the hay fever, the histamines, <laughs> working, but nothing to be alarmed about because I, I know what happens. That's, that's, the, that's what I'm the most allergic to. You can see pollen on the dust of the ca uh, cars. Uh, uh, you know, it's green. The cars are green. If it's a dark-colored car, it's, the car is green. That doesn't bother me one bit. I mean, I can snort it if I wanted to, I suppose. Not going to bother me, but it's the it's in the getting into the fall of the year. Some Someone thought I was having some kind of a, 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 a problem, respiratory problem, but I knew what it was. I, I thank them for their concern, but the point is there was nothing theoretically wrong with me. But I, I'm not going to mind all of the negativity, you know. I'm telling you, that's not good for you. Uh Someone told me the other day about a particular minister. Uh, came out of his house with a shotgun. Uh, the police came and they they had to shoot him. And I, I said to the brother, the, the man was a minister. I said, well, he probably thought all this out. Didn't want to take his life. He knew for certain that was a, that was sin. That was wrong. So he set up a situation where the police took him out. They shot him and killed him. He didn't do it himself. Now, I'm not God, and I certainly would never justify that in any capacity. No way. But what does that tell you? They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's where his thoughts were. Uh, we're told in Luke 21, 20, Luke 21, 25, 
There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, anxiety, fear, anxiety. People talk about, oh, I'm so anxious, anxiety attack. Quit living in that vein. Let me ask you this, and I'm going to close. When's the last time you got down to pray and all you did was thank God? You just thanked God. God, I thank you for saving me. God, I thank you when I was a rebel in sin, you didn't leave me. God, thank you for being long-suffering to me. What an idiot I was, and you were so long-suffering to me. Thank you for my health. Thank you that I can read your word. I have good eyes to read your word. I, I have good hearing to hear the man of God preach and proclaim the word of God. How many times do you just go and thank God and don't ask for anything, but you just thank God? You, you start living like that. You start thanking God. You know what? You'll begin to be edified, and you'll come out of that some of that stuff. Now, I'm not talking about positive confession. The Holy Spirit is to comfort us. I said the Holy Spirit is to comfort us. And sometimes we get a gut punch. I got one back in October, you know, had to cancel the meeting. So disappointing. The year before that, two years before that, COVID came, had to shut down that meeting. Very disappointing. But I can't dwell on the negativity. I've got to dwell on something positive that will edify me and lift me up. God's word will edify you. Your prayer life will edify you. And you start thanking God. I love Psalms 103 verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all of his benefits, who forgiveth thee of all thine iniquities, who healeth thee of all thy diseases. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Do you ever bless God? Or do you just come and grumble, and bicker, and moan, and groan, and murmur? And say, oh, God, this is not worth it. Oh, Paul said in Romans 8 and 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul said, There's no comparison, my suffering, and the glory that will be revealed in my life. God bless you. I'll see you Monday. Have a great weekend. The Voice weekend. of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.